Um, I'm not going to read over all the, the um, instructions and everything because they're pretty clear. I hope. I hope they make sense. If they don't, ask and or email me. Um, but what I do want to emphasize is in that first paragraph, the, the item in bold, make sure each quotation is really pertinent. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this is I've had some students in the past, you know, throw in, yes, quotation marks, page number, one word. And I'm like, what the hell, man? I mean, um, so 10 to 30 words, don't really go over that unless it's really, really, you know, important. Um, and, you know, I specify in, in each of the questions um, how many quotations you need to have or, you know, you need to have a quotation for a certain number of books, that kind of thing. We'll go over that in just a moment. Notice I'm giving you over spring break to work on this as well. It's not due next week. So you got a lot of time for this. Um, so you can think about it a little bit and then work on it, etc. It's not very long, 500 to 1,000 words, not under 500 words, not over 1,000 words, please. Um, so your five topics. <clears throat> In the fairy story essay, which you've got a link to, if you use the electronic version um, that I've sent you, just click the link and it'll take you right to that essay. Um, Tolkien claims fairy stories, fantasy literature, offers adult readers fantasy recovery, escape, consolation. In what way or ways does or do the Chronicles of Perdane offer adult readers recovery? And we've talked about recovery in class, so you ought to be a little bit familiar with that anyways. How do these novels help us to see the world as we are meant to see it? In your response, quote from the essay, Tolkien's definition of recovery. Okay, So that'll probably be your first quotation. Um, and then include at least one quotation from at least three different Preday novels. I don't care which three. You choose. Okay, um, So you can have at least four sources on your works cited page. Tolkien and then three um, novels by Alexander. All right? uh, if you need information how to handle multiple works by a single author, I'm pretty sure that's included on the section in the back of your syllabus. I said it was. If it's not, if it's not, I'll email it um, to you. Actually, I don't think it is. I'll email you a sample of that. Um, so there's that one. In the second one, I've got a quotation from the fairy story essay, and then I say, referring to the essay to explain the quotation, and then quoting from at least three of the pre-day novels, and again, those quotations, 10 to 30 words in length, explain how the novels show, quote, things in the world as it appears under the sun. That's not talking about the world of the Pridain novels. That's talking about our world. How do the novels show things in our world as it appears under the sun? Okay. Um, and discuss how the characters choose not to be enslaved to those facts, that is, the things in the world, etc., as they are in the sun. Okay. So again, four sources on your excited page. Number three, discuss the theme of sacrifice in the Chronicles of Pridain. And I don't Say much more than that, allow you to um, go after it. Three novels, quotations. Four, in what way are these novels about the process of maturation, growing up? What does the process of growing up entail? What is the goal, so to speak, of growing up? Include quotations from at least three. And then in the last one, um, you know, some people might think number five is pretty much the same as number four. <clears throat> I don't think it is. In the course of the novels, what life lessons does Taryn and the reader learn? Okay. Important lessons about life that, you know, he needs uh, to successfully, quote-unquote, navigate life. Okay. So again, 
That is due beginning of class on Monday, March 11th. Now, before we go on to High King, hopefully you watched one or both of those High King lectures to get you a little bit um, into the novel. Because um, I'm going to, uh, I don't want to go go back to some of the earlier stuff that I covered in those. I am going to pick up, however, a little bit before where the second um, video lecture ended, which I think was around 105 or 106. Um, I'm going to go back to about page 92. And we won't finish hiking today. We'll probably, we'll definitely finish it on Monday. I mean, we might get pretty far today. Which, no, we won't. Not 37 minutes. We won't. Um, but on page 92, Taryn has met up with some of the people of the Free Kamats. He's passed through. He's seen Medwin. Medwin has, you know, sent out his, his word to the animals of Pridane, et etc., cetera, et cetera. And he meets up with the, the leaders, so to speak, of the Free Kamats. And right on the middle of page 92, we have Heaven the Smith kind of call out, the folk of the Free Kamats honor King Math in the house of Gom. Right? Notice, they honor them. Doesn't mean they serve them. Doesn't mean they're loyal to them. Doesn't mean that they have allegiance to them. Okay? But they will answer only to one they know as a friend. Why isn't King Math and the sons of Don, uh, or the house of Don, why aren't they regarded as a friend? Have they ever been to the Free Kamats? Nope. Notice the Free Kamats are kind of their own entity. Okay. But who has? Terran. And they follow, follow him not in obligation but in friendship. And so let heaven be the first to follow Terran Wanderer. Okay? And so he tells Terran, you toil bravely in my smithy, now my smithy will toil for you. In other words, now I'm going to make swords, spears, etc. for you. And he says, and all the metalsmiths will. Okay? So people start coming. They start thronging okay, to the banner of the white pig. Who made that banner? I long we did. What was one of the... Why did she go back off to the Isle of Mona? What was she supposed to learn? How to be a... How to be a lady. How to be a princess. Apparently, one of the princess arts that she learned was how to sew. Okay? Or how to embroider, more specifically. So, what did she do? She made a banner of a white pig. Why? Because... She's clairvoyant and knew that some point in the future, Terran would be a great war leader? No, because he's an assistant pig keeper. It's almost like she was, I don't want to be, I don't want to go too far with this. Not making fun of him, but kind of, not really mocking, but emphasizing he's a pig keeper. And so she puts a banner of a pig on it, okay? Um, let's see, Lanio shows up, and others do, okay, and Lanio mentions, you know, you don't, you don't only need swords and daggers and spears as weapons, what else makes a perfectly good weapon? An axe makes a good weapon, pitchfork can make a good weapon, you know, you got four long, or maybe three long, Narrow times, those can easily pierce a body, okay? So, Taryn speaks to heaven. Heaven says, that's right, we can make that work, etc., etc. So then he meets up with Dwivik. And Dwivik 
shows him a gift and she puts it around Ilanwi's shoulders and it's a cloak. Okay. So what skill is she offering to Terran and his followers slash warriors? She says, in every Kamat, shuttles will fly for the sake of Terran Wanderer. Well, why is that important? Why, why do they need cloaks? Identity. Identity? Okay. What else? A oh, winter's coming. It's going to be cold. They need to stay warm. Okay. Hlasar shows up. And Terran finds out Lasser's dead, father is dead. Terran thinks, you know, he ought to go back home, be with his mother. He says, no, I'm here. Okay. <clears throat> and he tells Terran, middle of page 97, others will tend my flock. My mother knows what a child must do and what a man must do. In other words, time for me to grow up. Time for me to leave the sheep and do what? Defend the sheep how? By defending not only his Kamat, but all of Perdane. I am a man and have been one since you and I stood against Doroth, etc., etc. Okay? And then Lasser tells him, page 98 at the top, to you rather, our pride, uh, Taryn at the end of 97 says, Gwydion will be grateful to you. Lasser says, to you, rather. That is, Gwydion will be grateful to you, Terran. Why? Because we're not fighting for Gwydion. We're fighting for you. Our pride is not in fighting, but in farming. In the work of our hands, not our blades. Never have we sought war. We come now to the banner of the white pig, because it is the banner of our friend. What did Terran tell King Smoit? Back in the early part of Terran Wanderer, about Gorian and Gast, when Smoit merely wants to throw him in the dungeon and let him, dungeon and let him rot. It's not going to do any good. And he can beat him till they're senseless. It's not going to do any good. He says, what will, what will solve this problem? You have to get their allegiance. And the other day, I talked the other day, two weeks ago, whenever it was, I talked about, you know, the consent of the governed, okay? Notice what Terran has here. He has the allegiance of these people. They want to follow him. There's not any threat, okay? And then we're told, bottom of page 98, Terran was grateful for Call's wisdom and such. And it was Call who gave him the thought of marshalling the camps that marshalling camps grew smaller to send smaller, swifter bands to care Dathel rather than march from one Kamat to the next. So as more and more people come, Call says, why don't you send them off like in groups of 25? So there's kind of a, an ever-increasing band at care Dathel rather than march one huge army of whatever the number would be, 500, 1,000, you know. Okay. So Terrence says to Call, you are the oak staff. You are the sturdy tree that I lean upon. And Call says, do you mean to honor me? Then say I'm a true grower of turnips and a gatherer of apples. Why? He doesn't want to be remembered. He doesn't want to be known for his martial prowess. No warrior wherever. No warrior would ever save that I am needed thus for a while. Well, what did Lasser just say? We're not warriors. We are farmers. But we are will willing to turn our plowshares into swords for you, Terran. Why? Because Terran taught them how to do that previously to defeat Doroth. Okay? Call says, my garden longs for me as such as I long for it. I left it unready for winter, and for that I will pay a sorry reckoning. Call, even though he's getting ready to go off and fight in battle, he's thinking, when this is over and I get back to Care Dalbin, what kind of you know spring am I going to have? It's gonna be hard. Why? 
because he's going to have to till the ground and prepare it for spring planting, which is what he would have done normally in the fall. He would have turned the soil, he would have turned the dead crops into the soil to provide you know, nutrients for it and such. Terrence says, don't worry, we'll do it together. Okay. And then he says, my heart too will be easier when I am once more an assistant pig keeper. He's just re totally reversed what he said at the beginning of the first novel. Don't want to, he is a hero, right? He's already a hero. He, he could check that off his bucket list. He already has people following him. He is a warlord for Gwydion. Okay? Now, I just want to go back and be an assistant pig keeper. So, we go on. Terran meets Anlaw. Well, what's Anlaw going to make for him? You can't make a sword out of pottery. You can't really make any weapon out of pottery. But he meets Anlaw, and Anlaw takes him to his pottery wheel. And we're told, bottom of page 100, Terrence sits there, puts his hands on the clay as the clay is spinning. And as he spins, all his tension, all his anxiety rushes out of him. He, he just kind of, you know, enters a zen zone, as it were. And Anlaw says, sorry, I, I, I can't give you anything that will help you. Top of 101. Taryn, you have given me more than all the others, and I treasure it the, the most. My way is not the warrior's way. That is, he's saying, my purpose in life is not the warrior's. But if I don't bear my sword now, nobody in Perdane will what? Will be able to turn clay. Farm fields, sheet metal, weave cloth. There will be no place in Perdane for the usefulness and beauty of any craftsman's handiwork. Because what is the craftsman's handiwork? Tolkien in that essay talks an awful lot about some creation. The craftsman's handiwork is what? It's their art. Whether that art is a piece of pottery, a piece of clothing, a piece of metal. Even if that art, even if that piece of metal is something entirely functional, like a horseshoe. We don't normally think of a horseshoe as art. And, but it is art if what? If the smith tries to make the very best horseshoe he or she may. Tries to make, if the weaver tries to make the very best piece of clothing, okay, and in doing so, puts a bit of him or herself into it, all right? Well, what happens? Tyrion leaves that kamat, and it gets attacked. And Anlaw gets killed. Terran goes to it. He finds Anlaw's hut, page 103. And he finds his body amid the rubble. All of his pottery shattered. Now remember, when Terran first went there, he said, Man, this is, this is like a treasure house. Gorian and Gast would be aghast at this treasure. And now it's all destroyed. Terran drops to his knees. Call puts his hand on his shoulder. Terran draws away and says, Did I shout for victory today? Why? They won one victory. They won a skirmish, but they lost this one. Small comfort to folk who once befriended me. The blood of Marin is on my hands. Later, Laster speaks with Call and says, Terran's still there. It is harsh enough for each man to bear his own wound. What's he mean his own wound? Might mean literal. Literal wound on the body. 
Or it might mean wound having lost someone he loves in a particular battle. But he who leads bears the wounds of all who follow him. Notice, this is something Taryn hasn't had to deal with before, is it? Well, except for Rune. But he's not led men into battle. I mean, he had the skirmish with Doroth. Yes, they didn't lose anybody then. But now he's what? He's losing people who are dear to him. How did Rune die? Anybody remember? At Smoit's castle? Terran's captured. Gwydion's captured. Rune, Fluter, and, and Ilanwi come up from the outside. And they're kind of like, Ilanwi, something's wrong with this picture. If Gwydion was there, she would expect to see his flag, his banner, flying from the castle. And it's not. And they would be expecting the gates to be open, to be welcoming them. And they're not. And Fluter and Rune are kind of like, well, do, 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 you know, and she's, so Fluter goes in and he gets captured. Okay. They meet up, they find Gwistle and stuff, and they get, you know, the potions and powders, explosive things. And what does Rune do? He sacrifices himself in a diversionary tactic. He rides in the front gate with, on his horse, and he calls out to the other riders. Well, there aren't any other riders. That creates a panic by Mag's men who have taken control of the castle. And it allows Gwydion and the others from inside to escape and attack, defeat Mag's men. Not Mag, he escapes. Okay. But what happens to Rune? He's dead. He sacrifices himself so that the others can escape. So now he's got Rune. Now he's got Anlaw. By the time we get to the end of the novel, Lanio is going to be dead. If I remember right, Lasso is going to be dead. Call is going to die pretty soon. Okay. What does he take from Anlaw's hut? He takes something and keeps it with him. A burned fragment of pottery. Why? This is his never forget. You know, every year on September 11th, various publications, various, you know, websites, cable channels will have never forget. And they'll show, you know, images from 9-11. It used to be December 7th. Never forget. Before that, it was Remember the Maine. Never forget. Okay, from the Spanish-American War. Chapter 10. So they make their way. They get to Cardathel. They kind of, you know, it's not necessarily a victory party, but they get there, and the castle is, you know, it's just huge and magnificent. And they're thinking, okay, nothing can conquer this place. Terrence brought a huge army. Gwydion's there. He's thankful. King Math is there. He's thankful. Okay. He talks, King Math tells Terrence, page 108, you know, about what's going to happen, a little bit about the history of Pradain and such. And... He tells them their real hope lies in Pradary, bringing the host from the West Country, essentially. Okay. So, Terran's given leave to, you know, go relax for a bit, and he does. Um, Taliesin comes in. And Taliesin, page 111, <clears throat> Talks to Fluter about his harp. He says, I knew what the harp did when I gave it to you. Knowing your own nature, suspecting you'd always have some small trouble with the strings. So, I knew what the harp's tendency was, why 
I knew what your tendency was. So the heart matches the player. Fluter says, trouble? No, nah, no, nah, never gave me any trouble. Bing, bing, you know, two strings break. Why? Because that's an out-and-out, bald-faced lie. And he says, you know, actually, the pots forced me to tell the truth. A little more than I normally would. But, you know, telling the truth is harm to no one, least of all myself. In other words, the harp has helped Fluter to do what? Telling the truth is good thing or bad thing? Stupid question, right? It's a good thing, right? Telling the truth is a virtue. The harp has helped Fluter to become more virtuous, to practice the virtue of truth-telling. And Taliesin says, then you've learned no small lesson. That's, a, that's an example, I think I used the word in here the other day, of lycopenes. It's an old English poetic technique. It means understatement. No small truth means then you've learned a great lesson. The gift was in jest. And that is, you know, I knew what your problem was. So I kind of, but you've borne it willingly. That is, you've borne this harp Willingly. Now, and he points to a shelf because they're in a storeroom like it is, like it were, of harps. He says, take your pick. Imagine you're a guitar player and you get to go into, I don't know, the guitar showroom that owned, that had all the guitars of, pick your favorite guitars, Johnny Cash, Eric Clapton, Prince, etc. Take your pick. He can choose any of these harps, harps that Taliesin, the greatest bard, owned. Take your pick. And he says, you know, I'll keep the one I have. I swear, it seems to play of itself at times. None has a better tone when the strings are fixed, that is. It sits well against my shoulder, not to belittle these, but, you know. In other words, he and this harp work together. The harp is meant for him. Taliesin says, okay. So, he talks about what is in this hall that they're in and what used to be in that hall. All the craft secrets of Pradane that Aran stole. Okay. Gergi says, page 113, he wishes that he had wisdom. And Taliesin says, no, you have wisdom. There are many kinds of wisdom. Yours is the wisdom of a good and kindly heart. Notice, those are virtues. Scarce it is, and it's worth all the greater. Such as that of Kal, son of Kalfruer, and added thereto the wisdom of the earth. That is, Kal has a good and kindly heart. He also has the wisdom of the earth, the gift of making, of walking, of waking barren ground and causing the soil to flourish in a rich harvest. Call goes, yeah, I don't do that. that. The garden does that. Taliesin's making a point there. He's saying, it doesn't do it of its own. Why? Because they're about to go to a portion of Pradane that contains what kind of ground? barren. It's called the red fallows. It's fallow because it hasn't been tilled, it hasn't produced anything in a long time. Why is it red? Remember Adion's statement to Taryn? That he has seen a field steeped in blood and one that produces and he says, there is more honor in a field well tilled than in a field steeped in blood. The field steeped in blood, that's the red fallows. The ground is red because of the blood that was shed on it years ago. It's still red. Okay? So, 
Um, I long, we said, I was sent to the Isle of Mona to gain wisdom. All I learned was needlework, cooking, and curtsying. Taliesin. Learning isn't wisdom. In your veins, princess, flows the blood of the enchantresses of Lear. Your wisdom may be the most secret of all, for you know without knowing. Intuition, is that what he means? It's not quite clear. Taryn, alas for my own wisdom. I was with your son when he met his death. This is page 114. He gave me a brooch of great power, and while I wore it, there was much I understood, much that was hidden, grew clear to me. The brooch is no longer mine, if indeed it ever was. What I knew then, I remember only as a dream, lingering beyond my power to grasp it. That is, beyond my power to take hold of that dream and understand it. And Taliesin then says, There are those who must first learn loss, despair, and grief. Of all paths to wisdom, this is the cruelest and longest. But notice, loss, despair, and grief are a path to wisdom. Not the easiest. Are you one who must follow such a way? I don't know. If you are, take heart nonetheless. Take heart means have hope. Those who reach the end do more than gain wisdom. As rough wool becomes cloth and crude clay a vessel, so do they change and fashion wisdom for others, and what they give back is greater than what they won. They change and fashion wisdom for others. They pass it on. That is, they take those experiences of loss, despair, and grief and turn them what? Loss into gain, despair into hope, grief into joy. How? They learn from them. Not learning like from a book. They take those experiences and those experiences transform those individuals. Okay? So... We skip a bit more. Prideri shows up, and he shows up for what purpose? Why do they think he's coming? <clears throat> to aid in the battle. Instead, he's there to demand surrender. He sided with Iran. Okay? And... Page 122. Prideri and his forces leave. They get ready to have a battle. And we're told. Um, top of 122. Gwydion has marshaled his forces and such. Telling his war leaders what he wants of them. And we're told, Terran felt uneasy. As a boy, he had dreamed of taking a man's place among men. Well, he <laughs> got his dream. And as a boy, he had deemed himself well fit to do so. Now, amid the grizzled, battle-wise warriors, his strength seemed feeble. His knowledge clouded. Clouded, not clear. Call, sensing Terran's thoughts, winked encouragement. The stout old farmer, Terran knew, had paid close heed to Gwydion's word, that is, He'd listen clearly. The implication is, Taryn, he's focusing not on what Gwydion has been saying, but he's been focusing on himself, so he's not as clear. All right? So, battle starts. And call saves Taryn's life. Caradathel falls, and we get chapter 12, the red follows. Lanio is dead. We're going to move on a bit. 130, 131, Gwydion says, the only way we can succeed is to divide our forces. Why? Well, 
Caradathel's up here, Free Kamats are over here, the Newman's over here, the coastline's over here. He says, what I've got to do is I've got to get to the ships of the Pradari, or the ships of the House of Dawn. They're still there from when we came over, however many years ago that was. He said, and we can take those ships and we can attack Anuvan essentially from the rear. What I need you to do, Taryn, is over here, I need you to essentially serve as what for the cauldron board? Bait. I need you to distract them so they don't head back to Anuvan. Okay? Page 131. Um, take that back. 132. He says, um, I have to lead the seaward march. Taryn, will you accept the other journey? Taryn, I serve as you command. He goes, no, 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 I'm not going to command this. Nope. I order no man to do such a task against his will. What is Gwydion showing us there? What did Taryn say a king needs in order to command? Allegiance. People must choose to follow. Gwydion is saying, I can't command. Taryn says, I'll do it. Then it is my will to do so. Okay? So, he doesn't say you've got to destroy the cauldron board. Just delay them for a little while. Okay? If either side fails, they all lose. So, Taryn agrees. So he's going to lead Gwydion's host, essentially. Gwydion's going to lead a small force of men over to the ships and such. So page 135. They get a sight. The two groups have now split. They get a sight of the cauldron born host, and it's huge. And he asks, call, top of 135, can we hold them off at all? That is, can we slow them down even a bit? A pebble can turn aside an avalanche, or a twig stem a flood. Well, how? If it serves as an obstruction, it diverts that avalanche or flood just a little bit. Call is saying all we have to do is divert the cauldron born away from their goal of reaching Anuvan. If we can make them take a slightly longer road, that should be enough. Okay? So, they march on and they reach the Red Fallows. And Call tells him what the Red Fallows used to be. And for the land of Perdane, they had been, essentially, the Garden of Eden. The best growing land there was. He says, but in the fighting over it, in time the land died, this is page 136, the land died as did those who strove to claim it from their fellows. Soon its blight crept far beyond the battlegrounds. In my younger days, I too marched with the battle hosts and left not a little of my own blood in the fallows. A little bit of foreshadowing, because what's going to happen? Call's going to die there. Okay? So, let's keep going on. They fight the Cauldron Born, 141. Taryn says, you know, one oak, stout oak tree has turned it, talking about it was Call primarily that helped them defeat the Cauldron Born in a skirmish, not entirely. And Call says, I'm a farmer, but warrior enough to know my own death wound. Go along, my boy, carry with you no more burdens than you must, meaning my death is not on your head. You're not to blame for this. Taryn, will you have me break the promise I made that we would dig and weed together? Call says, I'd hoped one day to sleep in my own garden. Choice is not mine. Why? What does he mean? He, Alexander, not he, Call. 
we don't choose the day of our death. We don't choose the time of our death. Okay? So, just before he dies, he tells Taryn, see to our planting. That is, make sure you plant those turnips. Okay? And Call dies, and they ride on. <coughs> now, pause for a moment. Go back to the be beginning of the novel. What was the prophecy that Henwin told, or that the sticks told? Page 31. Quench will be Durnwin's flame, vanished its power, night turned to noon, and rivers burn with frozen fire, ere Durnwin be regained. Okay. Well, what's happened to Durnwin? And stolen, right? So it's been quenched, it's been vanished. So now we have three other parts of the prophecy. Night will turn to noon, rivers burn with frozen fire, before Dern yeah, wind is regained. Um we'll pick up with the chapter darkness. Let's see here. On Monday and finish this then. Um, if you haven't started reading Sabriel, you should start for Wednesday.